All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and give an introduction. Um, so today we have Kevin Harms and Sadir Chunduri uh, talking about Darshan and Autoperf. So uh, both Kevin and Sadir work at Argonne National Lab and I've had the pleasure of, of working on them, looking at uh, network performance and routing in the past and congestion. So um, they have a lot of experience uh, looking at and profiling the performance of their systems at Argonne, um, particularly looking at MPI usage, uh, numerous papers at SC. So it should be a, a good talk and hopefully we can learn some, um, some valuable tips on how we can implement something similar or collect this kind of data at NERSC. And with that, I'll, I'll let you go ahead, Sidhu. Okay. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, uh, so as Taylor was saying, uh, we have this uh, tool, Autoperf. I mean, it, it is quite similar to the NERSC tool, the IPM. Um, uh, so we have a version of Autoperf called Autoperf 1.0, we called it, which was uh, used on Mira, BGQ mission. And we have made some improvements uh, on that. That's, that's what we call it as out of 2.0. And out of earlier, it was a standalone uh, software package. Now it has become part of Darshan. So that's why Darshan is coming in here. So I'll talk about uh, what we have been doing with out of and um, then uh, Kevin Hams, he will talk about the darshan part of it. Yeah, please uh, feel free to interrupt if you guys have any questions. So out of uh, the, the design goal is uh, for it to be a monitoring tool. So uh, to run on the system for all the applications collecting monitoring data. So uh, as you could guess, it should be with low overhead. So it's a low overhead profiling tool, uh, not like uh, like Graypat or this kind of uh, tower, this full-fledged profiling tools. We want to kind of capture uh, with minimum possible overhead, some useful information. So this was used in production on um, Mira. And uh, so it provides a very coarse grained uh, resource usage characteristic. Like uh, uh, one of the module, one of the key module in the of tool is the MPA uh, component. So it collects uh, the MPA usage, like what are the different collective, I mean, for each MPA operations, it collects few statistics. And uh, if you kind of uh, analyze the logs, out of logs across, say, some set of jobs collected over a few months, a uh, uh, few years or so, then you can um, kind of extract some useful information out of those saying like, okay, how is MPA being used? What kind of operations are being used predominantly? What kind of, uh, what uh, range of message sizes are being used predominantly or uh, and so on and so forth. Those kind of um, usage statistics can be collected. Um, and also in the earlier version of the Autopuff, it also has uh, some, collect some uh, CPU counters, like uh, SIMD usage, how many SIMD instructions are used. Um, I mean, at that time, at least the GPU was not there, but we now add the GPU usage counters also. And then the network performance counters. Uh, we have for the Cray Aries, we have the network performance counter module as part of Auto of The memory resource usage and also collects some minimal information from the job, um, job specific uh, information, primarily because um, we want, if you want to correlate the job logs with Auto of logs, we need to have some references so that the correlation can be done uh, in a smoother way. So uh, the use cases, uh, 
uh, that uh, at least from our experience of uh, looking at this data, we could say that uh, some useful information could be um, brought out from this data. And we think this will be useful for the MPA for standardization priorities. Um, I'll give you some examples from what we have learned from the data on the MIRA. So, and also for the MPA developers, okay, which MPA operations are being used predominantly, where they should be spending more time looking for further optimizations, um, rather than spending time on some uh, operations which are not used by the production applications predominantly. Especially the third bullet uh, is more, uh, we envision that this will be more useful for the future uh, uh, systems where, uh, as you all know, we have this uh, quality of service uh, uh, classes, etc. to tune those, okay, which application to be placed in which quality of service class. So if you collect some network counters and if you can do some characterization of the applications, um, like binning, uh, mapping applications, uh, we could get some uh, some useful information from this Autocof tool for the mapping. And also, we have done um, some, um, especially when we were evaluating some design points for the Aurora. So there were some questions asked, for example, like okay, this in this much injection bandwidth is that sufficient for the future mission or so. So we try to do you based on the auto of data, some analytical modeling, um, try to do, okay, given this on, on the future mission, would this particular injection bandwidth, would that be sufficient or so? That kind of analysis could be done as well. <clears throat> so uh, with auto of 1.0, uh, it collects, um, it has these modules like MPA specific and few BGQ processor specific and OS specific and job specific um, uh, aspects it collects. But the MPA is the uh, primary one which we have looked at to. Our collaborators have also looked at all the four. Um, I, I'll provide a reference to that as well. So, but predominantly I'll be focusing on MPA aspect. <clears throat> So for each MPA um, operation, it uh, basically collects for all the point to point and collective or all the operations it accumulates like, it essentially maintains like three counters like the call count, how many times, for example, an MPA send is called. So for each MPA send call, the count uh, counter will be incremented and the call time, the time for the send and the call bytes. So for, for an application, uh, for the, then it collects for all these MP operations, it collects this log for each rank. Then it does some summary, summarization across um, all the ranks and reports data from few ranks. So for, from our, our uh, measurement, uh, these kind of add up to like few hundreds of cycles of overhead. More details are there in the <clears throat> paper that um, at uh, Supercomputing 2018 paper. So uh, each rank collects the data, but uh, since um, uh, to kind of reduce the log size, and since the log, at least in the autop of 1.0, we the log output is a text form, is in text format. To reduce that, we just report the data from four ranks. And those four ranks are like, one is the obvious like rank zero. And the other one is the, across all the ranks that they have in the application, the rank with minimum MPA time. So uh, it has an already call and find out like what is the, uh, which is the rank that uh, has the minimum MPA time and the max, the rank with maximum MPA time and the rank with an MPA time that is closer to the average MPA time. So the data from those four ranks is what reported from these logs. Uh, and the interface that uh, used for the intercepting these counters is through the PMPA, MPA from the MPA standard, PMPA, MPA profiling interface. 
um uh, this was run on the bjq for over i think uh, four plus years and we collected at that point um, we collected like uh, around like 100k plus logs uh, we looked through and tried to extract some uh, meaningful insights from that so as an example so dear could i ask you a couple of quick questions yeah um here just uh to help clarify things for me um so this is doing um an aggregation over the whole run, right? There's no time series. No, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and is it, and it's, it's rank based, right? So for like, um, for like memory usage, is it able to um, assign some amount of memory used per rank, like using a Malix or something else, or is it um, kind of a node based memory usage? This is per rank, even the memory. Uh, Kevin, can you correct me? Uh, it's per rank. This was on BGQ. Um, okay, so it would not include things like system overhead or buffers for MPI and that sort of thing on no. the node. Um, and is it saving all of this data for each rank? Uh, no, it uh, for all. It only saves the data for like, um, you mean saving in the sense within the memory or are you saying? Well, okay. so, let, so let's say, um, you know, let's say it's counting calls to MPI send or something. Um, at the end, do you get um, statistics uh, for MPI send for each rank or just a global statistics for the whole, all ranks? Just for the four ranks. Um, uh, it reports the log, the, so the output of this auto proof uh, after the run would be one text text log, and that log contains uh, the statistics from four specific ranks only, not all the ranks. And okay. those those four ranks are uh, uh, like rank zero and the rank with uh, an MPA time that is the minimum MPA time and the rank with. The maximum MP time on the rank with an MP time that is close to the average MP time. Um, okay, so you, so any of the all the, the data you get is just for those four ranks. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, uh, since you were asking that, so in the order of two dot zero, we uh, the data the the log report would be. In the binary because it uh, the log infrastructure we use the darshan log infrastructure so there we don't do any kind of this aggregation we report the log re contains data from all the ranks okay so you uh, so you are saving all the data from all the ranks somewhere from i'm saying for the out of 2.0 for the next version that we, ah okay uh, yeah. okay thanks yeah. Any other any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, um, so some of these um, high level insight that we could clean are like um, the MPA specific, like what is the communication intensive intensity of the application? So by communication intensity here uh, we mean like uh, what is the total? What is the MPA time divided by the like total time? Um, loosely speaking, and the relative importance of um, each MPA operations in terms of the time, primarily by importance, I mean, and the message size um, across the operations. Okay, what is the kind of average message size for these operations? And what are the kind of different threading modes that are being used predominantly? So some of these uh, insights um, were like most production applications tend to spend like uh, less than quarter of the time in MPA. Um, uh, and the study on Mira shows that high number of applications spend like more than half of the time in MPA. I mean, okay, so this is the general assumption uh, we had, but uh, from this study, we see that uh, um, uh, I'll show you one plot. Like, if you see these, these are the different applications that we kind of uh, from the different uh, from the executables we kind of extracted which application that is. 
and the plot here is showing a fraction of that MPA time within the total time, and uh, the x-axis is the different applications, and the y-axis is the fraction of the MPA time. As you can see, the like uh, kind of more than half of the applications are spending uh, like more than fifty percent of the time in MPA. Uh, again, here uh, uh, there are some big caveats when I, when we say um, uh, MPA time, it is. Uh, the load imbalance is also included. It's not just like purely communication time. MPA time here is not equal to the communication time. So it also includes if there is load imbalance that is also shown as the MPA time. That is one uh, one big uh, drawback from from whatever uh, uh, infrastructure that we are using. So I guess I have a quick question about that. So yeah. how does um. I mean, so I'm guessing that most of these applications probably try to do some kind of overlapping, right, of communication and computation. It is how how should I think about that with these numbers? Yeah, I mean, if there is an overlap, uh, whether there is overlap or no overlap, unfortunately, that is not very clear from this data because. That is what we have is the MPA times, and there is no notion of um, uh, there is no way we could get from these three counters that we are using the call count and the the time. Uh, there is no way we could. Uh, I mean, at least as far as I could, I know there is no way to kind of think about the communication whether it is overlapped is happened or not. Well, this is strictly time in the MPI call, yeah. right? Yeah. So yes. Yes. actually this is a, um, depends on how I send and I receive or whatever is actually implemented in the library, right? How much it can actually overlap. But you, you can't tell, you're right, exactly. You can see something from, if you look at how much time is spent in MPI wait, for example. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess some people do non-blocking stuff with like probe and receive or whatever, but I'm guessing that's the minority. Uh, yes, Just, uh, that's right. it depends on the, the amount of work between the I send and the white. So it, it's just it's just not easy to answer that question with any measurement of anything. Just to add some clarification, as um, Sudhir said, this data was collected on Mira, and so MPI init thread wasn't used very much, and uh, non-blocking calls were not well implemented on this platform. So most of these are probably blocking calls. And so it, in this case, the data is mostly correct. Um, but as we'll get into later, we did identify various limitations of the data we collected. And that will, you'll see some changes in AutoPerf too. And one of the things we're hoping to get out of today is um, feedback from other people on what things we might change. Yeah. Uh, then the collectives are more significantly used than point to point. Um, I mean, one of the person from the MPH team was also involved in this effort. So, uh, so we, so it's, so from the from that aspect also uh, it, it was informative for us and what to look for from from this data and then the hybrid mpa plus open mp p thread applications are more widely used than expected um, i mean at least from the forum thought that those are not being used but uh, here 30% uh, of the profile jobs um, use mpa thread multiple I mean, they use it, um, they specify it whether the um, application actually uses that, that we can't say, but at least the flag is used. And the small message all reduce operations are the most heavily used part of MPA, like nearly like 20% of the jobs, and also like nearly 20% of the jobs use like large message, large message, like 512K byte, all reduce operations. 
And these are some of the uh, points that we could see, but I think uh, the more closer look at the data and depending upon the purpose for which we want to analyze, I think there is some scope to put further um, analysis on this data. Yeah, this I have already covered. And then the this is elect across all the applications, um, uh, across, the time across all the jobs, uh, whatever 100K logs, the, those jobs that we have seen. If you kind of uh, take the time in across all the collective, across all the MPA operations, you could see that all reduce, uh, the time for all reduce is uh, the predominant. Uh, next one is like, uh, the, the scale is a log scale. So the next one is like 8% for the broadcast, but the all reduce is the predominantly used collective. I mean, uh, probably not, these are not kind of uh, not new, but, uh, but to see the real data and kind of get some evidence was, was what more interesting. And then uh, the average bytes, um, uh, you can see for the different MPA operations, what is the average bytes, like all reduce. Um, there are, I mean, even though there are like a lot of small message all reduce, uh, the data is skewed because there is potentially some large message all reduce also there and this averaging is kind of skewing the data in that direction. And uh, as I said, some of our collaborators looked at, uh, we, we just looked only at the MPA data. Uh, some of the uh, collaborators also looked at, um, they kind of just took all this, the CPU counters uh, and also the job law, job law counters. And um, uh, I'll give a reference to that paper and all these MPA counters, et cetera. And their idea was they just fed this data on these features um, into a machine learning model. And this is a TSNE, TSNE plot, they call it in the machine learning. It's to visualize the high dimensional uh, data. And you can see that there is some clustering uh, of this data. And when they kind of label the, the, this data with the executable name, you could see that if this is some executable exhibiting certain kind of feature and uh, and also they they saw that getting mapped to a particular user name a particular user maybe this is some some specific milk milk application or something uh, and which is exhibiting a distinct feature from say from lamps say um, so they they could build that kind of application taxonomy just just using this data and feeding this uh, machine learning model to see okay which applications are uh, they in their paper they also discuss which applications are communication sensitive uh, are memory intensive etc so say so that that's interesting you know we're we're trying to do or at least I'm trying to do um, something similar um, using data we're collecting through um, LDMS. Oh great! Yeah, yeah, yeah. LMS, the you, yeah. Since you brought that up, I mean, I work with Taylor also on the LMS stuff. Uh, that's the network network um, uh, data, right? So, and we were all also able to see Kevin and all. I have worked on that. So we were all able to see some interesting um, features, especially with the adaptive routing with, uh, turned on and off. To see how the uh, yeah L LDMS is more like a collection and aggregation framework, so we're yeah. able to plug lots of different things into it: uh, networking, memory usage, um, I/O, and all kinds of things. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, Kevin. You can uh, you can pitch in, but uh, we have worked on something called like variability. So there is this run to run variability. Can we use this network counter data to understand whether a particular run 
was run was influenced by this congestion or not um so to that study like very we call it like v guide variable tick guide um so for that kind of analysis uh, we use this kind of feature engineering etc yeah. yeah so i think you know we don't get things like you know inside into the mpi calls and everything like you do which is great um but it does up uh, it does also open the opportunity to be able to take uh, data that's collected through autoper for some or, or something like that with the ldms data and correlate and see if you know if if we're getting the the same answers that we expect or at least given all the caveats and and the different ways of collecting yeah uh, i think you may have, be having a like a very um, very broad um, uh, scope here but we have done a little bit of that analysis like i'm happy to share uh, one paper at the uh, sc19 at the pmbs workshop uh, i'm happy to share that paper maybe that will that is also relevant okay. to what you're saying That would be interesting going back to the communication time versus MPI time to use the or try to use the LDMS data to separate the two. Yeah, you know, I had to I had to walk out for a second and I think maybe you covered this, but. Um, you know, I, I, you're probably timing the MPI calls from when. You know, when they are are called and then when they return. Um, but you could have situations where you're overlapping communication and other things, and I'm not sure how that might be handled. Yeah, uh, we we were uh, talking about that. Yeah, uh, so the, there is no easy way to get at least from the data that the counters that we are using. There is no easy way to uh, kind of get that information as whether the communication overlap happened or not. So it just even the load imbalance, everything is shown as just MPA time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, this uh, limitations are like yeah, only four. We are getting the data from just the four ranks, um, uh, and for the analysis, also we were just using the data from the average rank. Not, um, not we are not kind of kind of discarded the I mean we tried to uh, use um, okay can we get some idea of the load imbalance by comparing the data from the rank with maximum MPA time and the minimum MPA time and the average MPA time and uh, that effort was not uh, so pr fruitful uh, yeah I think uh, for the load imbalance we need uh, some more uh, statistics but nevertheless, we just use the average rank, um, uh, but that is also uh, will not give the complete picture as to what actually the application and pay time is. Uh, have, have, so, you, have you tried or considered trying to save this data for each rank? Um, you know, IPM used to save it for each rank, but of course that leads to a big a data management problem then at some point. Yeah. So uh, I'm in the next slide. I'm I'm talking like uh, this is as this is one of the limitation for the output of two dot zero. Um, we do capture the data from all the ranks, and um, the data the overhead, at least from our experiments on theta, this has been output of two dot zero has been in uh, production running on theta for I think close to three months or so. I mean. We did not have any complaints, um, at least on the data overhead. Or, uh, so, and since that is using the Darshan's logging infrastructure, the data is stored as a binary. Um, that was that I think that uh, issue was we were able to avoid that. Kevin will talk about that um, in the later slides. Okay. And uh, yeah, so these are some. Uh, so, yeah, one other issue is okay for for an MPA operation, only average time is recorded, so there is no notion of time distribution uh, is uh, not captured. Um, so then also the for, for MPA oper the message is also just if you have send with different sizes, what we what we do is for all the let, let's say if they send with ten calls. 
uh, nine calls with one byte message and um, one call with uh, say 10k the average will be computed as 10k divided by 10 like and say that the average message size is 1k uh, uh, but uh, we don't have the, that uh, so that's one limitation the average message size calculation that the, there is no distribution will not capture and the message size for the collectives all to all v is also not accurate um, with the averaging So, so we I'm not, I'm not saying that all these limitations were addressed in order of 2.0. At least we try to address some of these, but some 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 of these limitations limitations still do remain, and um, we hope to address them in the future releases of other of. And the other issue is that the coverage. I was telling you that it's 100k logs and Mira, etc., right? But Actually, if you look at the coverage wise, it's 25% uh, of the jobs only uh, in that two year or three year time frame data that we looked at. And we looked into why, why we were not able to collect, collect data for like 100% of all the, all the jobs that are running. Uh, there are some issues, we detailed uh, those issues in the paper, but some of these are like dependence on the PMPA profiling interface. And uh, only one tool can use this PMPA profiling interface. So if an application is linked already with a PMPA uh, wrappers, then Autopuff will not be able to uh, provide the log. And there are some applications like, for example, NEC 5000 that run quotes not reaching the finalize. Uh, so if they don't reach the finalize, then the, the the out of the summarization um, uh, won't happen and the log will will not be generated so i i haven't done this so much in a while but i was talking to somebody yesterday and they said that new versions of mpi allow multiple tools to use pmpi in, in at the same time uh you mean uh, qmpi there is something called qmpi oh maybe there's um, something new yeah, so some uh, that is not. I mean, it's it is a kind of they're part of the MPA tools working group in the MPA standard. Um, uh, Wesley Bland from Intel, he he has worked on that for the MPH code, and that is a working prototype. But I don't think that is. I mean, at least when I, he's also the kind of forum MPA forum uh, some. Some position is there here. Yes. So he mentioned that it may probably get standardized only in MPA 5.0 or so. So mm, okay. Thanks. Yeah. So we all so if if you go with the QMPA route, um, at least the coverage, uh, at least that issue of um, multiple tools linking that could be avoided. Yeah, now coming to the auto of 2.0. Um, so as I was mentioning to, in order to use the logging uh, and reporting framework and uh, with the binary log, we have made the uh, auto of as a part of Darshan and the Darshan 3.3. From the Darshan 3.3.0 release, auto of sub module is available. Um, and uh, so what we did was that, uh, as Kevin was mentioning, with the order of 1.0 on Mira, uh, only MP2.0 standard operations um, were collected. But now we kind of increased the number of uh, operations. And also we discarded some of those operations, um, which we think are not uh, heavily used. Um, so out of the 350p total operations in the MP3.1 standard, 74, which we think are the prominently used, are uh, intercepted in the autopilot zero. Uh, so, for example, like RMA calls and the non blocking collective so are included newly with uh, 2.0. And uh, we were talking about that message distrib. We don't, we only have that average message size and not uh, the distribution. Um, to address that, at least to some extent, we have we now use some binning. So instead of just capturing the average message size, like we kind of use some six bins, zero to two fifty six, and so on till one MB plus like that. 
um, so NPS stats for all the every rank is uh, reported and um, yeah the we we are now working on two things one is um, uh, the okay the log is generated and it has been running on uh, theta and theta GPU theta GPU is another system at um, ALCF it's a GPU based system and it has been running in production for the past few months and um, two things what what we are doing is uh, to analyze a single single log in a report format there are some application users want to kind of okay, they want to be, use this auto -perf as a profiling tool and want to get some high level information. Uh, for that pur purpose, uh, we have this, some single log analysis tool. And also similar to our SC18, where we looked at the multitude log analysis, um, we are also working on that the post-processing. Once we have kind of say hundreds of logs, how to kind of analyze those and uh, get some insights. Yeah, and um, so Theta, which uses static linking, um, and on the, the Theta GPU, which uses the dynamic linking, it is not a straightforward, and we had to use the LD preload. Uh, Kevin, do you want to um, uh, kind of come in here, like uh, to explain maybe that is relevant for you with the Perl motor? I think the dynamic linking uh, will be the default, right? I mean, if, if you, I mean the I mean the purpose of this talk when uh, we requested Tyler to set up this is that uh, if you guys are interested in this tool and have it um, and if you see some usefulness if you can have it running in production on the uh, nurse machines. Yeah. So. At uh, ALCF, Theta is still running with st static linking. We never converted over to dynamic linking, but um, Nurse did convert over to dynamic linking on Cori. So I think you guys ended up resolving how you would put Darshan in a dynamically linked executable by just using LDarshan somewhere in the link line. So on Theta GPU, we've been trying to, to decide like what the best approach is. Um, it's um, uh, NVIDIA DGX machine. And so it doesn't have like a, a programming environment similar to that of um, Cray or HPEs. Um, you have, you know, a, a random collection of compilers. And so at this time, we're just saying like, okay, just set um, LD preload if you want to capture this, but that's an opt-in type solution and we want to get more of an opt-out type solution. So it's default. Um, I wasn't sure if on Perlmutter you guys have investigated how you will be intercepting. Um, if, you, if you're still planning to use Darshan, how you will be intercepting? Will you be relying on Cray's um, or HPE's um, programming environment wrappers? Or will you be doing something different if you assume users will instead be using NVCC directly? I don't know if you have any comments on that or any ideas. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if, if Lisa, I don't think she's on, might be the best person. I don't know, Brandon, do you? Do you I, I don't know how we're doing Darshan right now. I know. Um, I, I mean, Alberto's on, who has been oh, okay. doing a bit of this, and we certainly do plan to um, put it on Perlmutter, but haven't yet. So I don't know if Alberto or Glenn have a. Okay. Yeah, the, well, we, the, we'd, the we'd definitely be interested in hearing your experience there and what you guys end up with. Because at the minimum, we try to apply best practices to Theta GPU. And of course, we have a future machine Polaris, which should be uh, more similar that we can at least definitely um, follow. Yeah, I guess I'll just chime in with like a little bit of a comment. I mean, I think that this this stuff is great and I hope we can enable the AutoPerf 2.0 type collection on, on uh, our systems as well. I just, we just have to make sure, I guess, that everything is is like nicely modular because lots of these performance tools um, can conflict with each other. So for example, we're using like the DC GMI, DC GMI interface for the, um, whatever the data center GPU 
thing is to collect some usage data with LDMS. Um, and so, you know, I know that in many cases you can't have more than one um, kind of profiler or sampler trying to, to touch that, that same data. And the, the same thing for like CPU performance counters, right? Like um, LDMS really wants to control which ones you're looking at. And we have to turn that off if like a user turns on a profiling tool, for example. Um, yeah, the, 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 but the, the, there's a fundamental difference here, right? LDMS works in, uh, on the system side of the house. It's running as root, basically. Autopath is running in user space. So that gives you different set of pros and cons. But as you're right, Brandon, meshing them together is actually really quite difficult because. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, a, it's also just a difference in philosophy of tracing versus sampling, right? You learn different things with, with different approaches. So I just think we need to exactly. think a little bit on how to, to uh, mix them. Yeah, that's a good point. I, 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 I had one other question I forgot. Um, as far as the counters that AutoPerf might read or have access to, is that is that user configurable? Um, or how, so how does that work? I can just provide one comment. We can get into this more later. Um, but one of the kind of aspects that we have with the combination of AutoPerf and Darshan is to try to maintain a modular approach. And so, yeah, if you're decided like you you provide a module for collecting some data, but we don't want to use that. You know, you can just build your version without that module. Like for example, AutoPerf contains kind of two modules, right? Now, from the Darshan perspective, they're independent modules, but we just bend them under this concept of AutoPerf. One is network counters, one is MPI. Uh, counters. If you only wanted MPI and not network, right, you can just enable one or the other or vice versa. Okay. Yeah, that, that's nice. Yeah. I mean, because uh, uh, one of the module is the GPU module, the third module that uh, uh, we are working on. So a site can decide to enable um, a GPU module if if they think that would be useful do you um expose this information to uh the the users who ran the jobs and, and if so how um, do they get access to it yeah on theta it is um uh, it is stored on it is kind of anyone can access that that path like um Luster logs, uh, where Darshan logs are there. Is that what I'm asking? So anyone can access uh, that log. Yeah, the the logs rest are restricted such that they're written to an area that's you know world writable, but the logs are you know forced to a group called Darshan, which has group read, and then otherwise users permissions. So like random people can't go and read your logs, but we do have the ability, a subset of people like Sudhir, myself, some other people who have participated in um, analysis work can read anyone's Darshan log. But like a user couldn't read their own data themselves? No, a user can read, freely read their own data. Okay. So if they always have, but for example, two people on different projects can't read each other's. Okay. Oh, well, that's, that's nice, actually. I just wanted to do a quick time check and point out, oh, it's oh, okay. 15 minutes left. I don't know how, how many slides y'all have. Yeah, we have like two, three slides. Yeah, okay. Okay. Kevin, you, you were part, you want to? Oh, sure. So we just want to add a little, uh, we were just discussing this. So um, you saw that for AutoPerf 1, we basically had our own tools for you know, kind of building things, our own log format, it was an ASCII text format, and then our own interception system. And these things were all sort of different from Darshan, but they did exactly the same thing. Um, and so when Darshan 3.0 was kind of created and had this modular format, 
it was natural to say like, let's build AutoPerf 2, but make it a module of Darshan. And so you can see in this little graphic, the idea is each module is sort of standalone in the sense that the core parts of Darshan don't know anything about the counters in here, but the module itself understands all the counters. So you can just make kind of arbitrary new modules, have them add counters, and the run, you know, the Darshan runtime will manage like, here's how much memory you have, here's what you can do. It will help you with the reduction step if you want, um, and things like that. And so we ended up deciding, let's just use all of this existing tooling that's got a lot more seasoning than the stuff we wrote for AutoPerf 1, which was specific to Mira, and then just build AutoPerf as um, separate modules. And so when we created AutoPerf 2, um, slight difference is that this is the first module that's external to the Darshan repo. So all of these other modules you would just find in the Darshan repo. Um, but ours is actually lives in its own repo. And there is still some source that requires you, you have to modify, you know, the core Darshan part to basically define that your module exists, right? That this is, there's an AP MPI and it, this is what its meaning is. And then the configuration um, also needs to be modified. It would be nice if we could somehow extract this part, but um, I'm not a configure expert to know how to move parts external and have them included in the configure AC. But um, so there's still some remnants that have to go into the main um, Darshan source, but we try to put most code into the AutoPerf repo that's specific to AutoPerf. And currently at this time, to build AutoPerf 2, it can only build be built in the context of Darshan. So it doesn't stand alone at this time. In the future, that's one thing we've kind of tried to consider is maybe we can bring back like the most basic build system and like put an ASCII logging that uses the existing, you know, basically Darshan uh, callbacks, but just can write out maybe an ASCII log or something. So we could build this and run it separately for Darshan for testing, but so far, that's like um, something far down the road, and we just mainly focusing on um, AutoPerf as a component of um, Darshan. If you want to go to the next, yeah. And then, so I'll just mention, um, I think Shane may have presented, so some of you may have seen more about Darshan 3 and PyDarshan um, somewhere else, but We've, I put recently in quotes, enable this Python based framework. I think we've had the Python framework for like two years, but we only finally were able to like productize it and put it in a release recently. And so this kind of lists a Python wrapper around the existing C library for managing log files. And so it's called PyDarshan. You can get it from this URL. Um, the core source for all the Python part is in the Darshan repo. But the idea is this is going to be um, the future of analysis tools and building them on this because it's a little bit easier to build tools on this Python framework than it is directly on the C framework. And so for the AutoPerf 2, we're, we're focusing on building all our tools in this PyDarshan framework going forward. And so integrating these with the existing summary. So on the right side is like graphs from our old summary then on the left side is kind of what PyDarshan looks like if you haven't seen it before. But these are a, a screen cap from a notebook. So you can put these in a Jupyter notebook and then easily generate graphs. And so we have, it's still a work in progress, but we have some initial work for extending the PyDarshan framework to support the AutoPerf module. So I have a quick question about the, the PyDarshan stuff. Um, like, and maybe looking at this plot tells me the answer, but uh, does, it, does it have nice support for um, like Pandas integration? Yeah, so um, one of the good and bad things is the, the core report object can give you data in three different formats. And I think we have three different formats because we didn't know which one we should have. So we'll give you back data as dictionaries or you can get back data as uh, NumPy arrays, or you can get data back as a pandas framework or a pandas data frame, sorry. 
So I think most of the work we've done is all using the pandas data frames. Yeah. I mean, this is just quickly like as I was saying, some of uh, the application people are interested in looking at just single log. So this is something work in progress. Okay, just looking at one log, um, what useful information can be. Okay, so the all reduce time is uh, across the wrong, across the ranks. So how how it is varying, and then here it is showing like uh, across the ranks how the time is distributed across different collectives. I mean, we are kind of looking at different ways to plot and yeah. what useful information to plot. Yeah, this is this is this is really cool. Um, I found one thing that was all was useful. I thought was kind of a a two dimensional array. Uh, kind of a heat map of, of various things you want to look at because you can you can really pick out load imbalance you know in a, at a glance and that kind of thing yeah so one of the key things that sudhir mentioned that previously we discarded all the per rank data and just gave you four ranks we look i mean it's a fairly sizable amount of data but it looks reasonable to keep for each job. So we're just keeping every ranks data with no um, reductions. So we can build a little bit more detailed um, data set for an individual job because we have all the ranks. And then we do as um, Sudhir is showing, we have some bins of data now. So we can also, it's not just strictly an average. Um, we yeah. can, show a little bit of a histogram for the various um, interfaces. That's cool. So, you know, when we were doing IPM um, a lot, <clears throat> one issue that we would get, and I guess this would apply to Darshan too, is that the overhead mostly calls by IO would be just enough to put the, push the job time limit up beyond what the user has set for their limit. And uh, so basically we'd hit a wall clock limit. I don't know if, if you see that often, it, and if so, how you might deal with that? I would say we mostly go by if users complain. Okay. And most users, like at least so far, right? Obviously in the MPI case, if you have a zero byte all reduce and all you did was call all reduce, the overhead's gonna be a bit higher because the amount of work you're doing relative to the reduce is, is small right or it yeah. is maybe more comparable but if you're running a four-hour job um, and you do at least some amount of computation um, the overheads tend to just become disappear and they're far less than the variability or the noise of the machine yeah i don't i don't think it was the i don't think it was the wrapping overhead it was the if you know if you got a um oh right a couple the hundred thousand one. rank job and you're collecting all the summary data for each one, and you try when you do the I/O when you you know try to say uh, that. yeah yes. So so far we've it's we've you know Phil and Shane have spent some time working on that, and the log sizes are still relatively small. So we've set some general options. We use MPIO for writing this data out, so that it only uses like four aggregators and writes it. It's it's usually pretty efficient. Like the, the log file names actually encode the time spent writing the log and they're usually not more than two seconds. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so I guess- oh, Well, that, that's great then, yeah. So I guess following up on the kind of performance question, um, that's okay. So so how, how big, so the log files are, are per job ID, is that right? Yeah. Okay, right. And and how big are they? typically like so the, the autoperf ones are a fixed size because right right um, i mean the autoperf two. Oh, the autoperf two, right we have as sudir said 79 counters and uh, i like mean, them for it yeah the log size varies with the number of ranks right um sure but i mean like i mean we're so we're talking we, like megabytes right yeah, megabytes. Uh, correct yeah, definitely. I think the yeah, okay. large That's... ones were like our largest one was like 200 or something like that. I can't remember if we, when we computed for like the largest possible job. Right. Yeah. So, so generating like the plots that you're showing here is, is order of seconds, right? 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in the IO side, you can have much bigger logs because this data is like whatever the number of ranks is, you're having a fixed number of counters. But if you open like 7 million files on the IO side, the counters are per file. So now you have 7 million records. Yeah. Um, so yeah. those have far much more variability than the um, MPI side. Yeah, I think IPM would optionally try to save topology data. Um, you know, who was sending to who, how often, and that sort of stuff. And I think that's where it got into a lot of the, the IO issues. Uh, I mean, probably you might got it, but just to clarify, these plots are not generated during the job run. This, this is a post-processing. Club. Right. Yeah. I guess my so the reason I ask is that here at NERSC we I I did some work so we have LDMS data that's joined with um, S account or sl so Slurm data, and that's kind of running in the background. And so if you go on Iris and click on a job ID and scroll down, there's like a variety of like per job plots that you can get. Um, and in order for that to be like, you know, there's a little progress bar. So as long as I can load something and turn it into an image in less than say 30 seconds or so, that's fast enough that uh, that you can, that we could think about integrating this into that framework versus like having to do like a, you know, a, a button to request an analysis, try again in an hour when it's done sifting through logs. Yeah. yeah, I would say on the, again, on the MPI side, it's pretty trivial, yep. but log, because it's bundled with Darshan, if someone has generated a large log because they open millions of files, um, the size of the log will be dictated by that. So it might take a bit longer to open. Um, although it can seek, you know, it, it has to do some, you know, it can seek directly to the, if you only load the, um, MPI, the, the autoperf modules, you know, it doesn't need to read the other ones. Um, it has offsets for each one individually, but ju just, there is some variability there, but you could probably just put a heuristic in to say, hey, this log seems large, uh, you know, maybe you, I can't do it um, real time. Right. Okay. So the MPI data is constant, right? So if you're like, I'm gonna, I know I have, this many counters times this many ranks is my generally effective maximum. You can just test that case and know what the run time is going to yeah. be. Yeah. So Brandon, I think I think that would be a perfect, uh, a perfect, a, a wonderful addition to what you described, and and really be a value added if we could do it. I think we are almost out of time. But so um, just one very quickly. So we have some. Uh, so as Kevin mentioned, we have this network counter uh, data, we call that APXC for the XC system. And uh, we would like to do that for the slingshot uh, as well. And for the GPU, we have this GPU module using the tau infrastructure. One student from the um, Oregon, he worked on it. So he, he thought that using the tau profiling infrastructure would be the ideal thing. And so that he had he had a work he has a working prototype of that on the Nvidia GPUs. Uh, and uh, yeah, and future we can look at the QMPA, etc. Yeah, I mean we want to deploy this on Polaris and Aurora. And uh, uh, yeah, I think these probably by now these are obvious. Like we can do a lot of co analysis, auto perf and LMS logs, auto perf and job logs. Um, Etc. These are more of futuristic research kind of things. Here are some references um, based on this work. This is what the, looking at the MPA data, and this is uh, our collaborators looking at uh, all the data out of version and the job log data and try to do some application taxonomy. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your your time any other final questions great Th thanks for the great talk and you know lively discussion we had going up to the minute so appreciate y'all joining for the data seminar and and hopefully we can have some internal discussions at NERSC about you know what 
an implementation of this might entail. Yeah, we'll, Kevin and I will we'll be happy to have any feedback or further questions. Yeah, please reach out to us. All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, thanks. we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks.